This program is brought to you by Emory University. Our speaker this morning is Dr. Marvin Liu. Marvin is one of our third year uh, clinical fellows. Um, he is originally from the Philippines where he did his, uh, to where he went to medical school, uh, came to the United States, did his residency at uh, Einstein uh, Medical Center in Philadelphia. And he will be an EP fellow here next year. And he is going to today give us a review of cardiac sarcoidosis. Marvin. Good morning, everybody. Uh, like uh, Dr. Williams said, uh, we'll be talking about cardiac sarcoidosis. I have no disclosure. Today, we're gonna learn how to approach a patient with suspected sarcoidosis determine the role of various imaging modalities for the diagnosis and identify why imaging is needed and how it can help us not just with diagnosing cardiac sarcoid, but also with our management. And finally, we're gonna to try to formulate treatment strategies and risk stratification and determine the role of ICD therapy in these patients. In order for us to achieve these learning objectives, we are going to start by talking a little bit about the pathophysiology of sarcoidosis, epidemiology, determine who should be screened for cardiac sarcoid. We're going to talk about multimodality imaging, particularly as it helps us with the diagnosis, prognosis, and how it can guide our therapy. And finally, we're gonna talk about management as it pertains to conduction disorders, supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias, and heart failure. The disease of sarcoidosis was first described in 1877, so about 143 years ago, uh, by a guy named Jonathan Hutchinson. He was the uh, first guy to describe the skin changes associated with sarcoidosis, but it wasn't until 30 years, I mean 20 years later in 1899, when a guy by the name of Caesar Peter Beck published the first comprehensive description of such skin changes and included histopathologic analysis showing these non-caseating, non-necrotizing granulomas. And he named the disease Beck's sarcoid, particularly because he thought the cells that he saw resembled sarcoma cells. And then 30 years later in 1929, Dr. Mitchell Bernstein described the first case of sarcoidosis that involved the heart. And here we are a hundred years later and we still do not fully understand the exact pathophysiology of sarcoidosis. So what do we know? We know that sarcoidosis is a granulomatous disease of unknown etiology. We know that the hallmark of the disease is the formation of these non-necrotizing, non-caseating granulomas, and it involves organs, uh, most commonly the heart, but it can also involve, uh, I'm sorry, most commonly the lungs, but it can also involve the heart, the liver, lymph nodes, spleen, eyes, among other organs. We know that the pathophysiology seems like it's an exaggerated immunologic response to an unknown antigenic trigger. So there's something in a patient's body that predisposes him to this antigenic trigger that causes the formation of these non-caseating granulomas. We know that there's a genetic predisposition because first degree relatives are at five-fold increase of risk. We've identified certain MH complexes um, in different races that predispose them to cardiac sarcoidosis. We've uh, discovered certain environmental and infectious factors that seem to be associated with sarcoidosis, although a direct causal relationship has yet to be, in, uh, to be established. So exposure to beryllium, zirconium, and aluminum, and infection with mycobacterium seems to be associated with the formation of sarcoidosis. 
we can think of sarcoidosis as a active inflammation that can go or spot anywhere in the myocardium. And these inflammations, if they are left untreated, can cause, depending on where they are, ventricular or supraventricular arrhythmias, or if the inflammation involves the basal septum, it can cause AV block. And finally, if the inflammation causes a widespread fibrosis and scar, the left ventricle will start to dilate and cause heart failure. We know that sarcoidosis comes in three phases. The first phase, which is the acute phase, is predominantly cellular, uh, small granulomatous disease uh, with lots of giant cells in hypercellular, uh, lots of inflammation. The, inf uh, the intermediate phase phase uh, is uh, still comprised of inflammation, but you start to develop these um, fibrosis and scarring and you start to form these granulomas. And in the late phase, you will see predominantly fibrosis with minimal cellularities um, and granulomas. So sarcoidosis is still considered a rare disease. Uh, the prevalence is about 4.7 to 64 per 100,000 worldwide. The prevalence is the same in the US with a uh, predilection towards African-Americans. It's most commonly uh, in patients who are 25 to 50 years old with 70% of them presenting at age 25 to 45. And for the past two decades, there's been a 20-fold increase in the detection of cardiac sarcoid due to increased clinical awareness and also advanced multimodality imaging, which we will be talking about later today. As it pertains specifically to cardiac sarcoidosis, about 5% of patients with sarcoidosis will manifest as cardiac sarcoidosis, although in autopsy studies, um, they see that at least one in every four patients with sarcoidosis have some form of cardiac involvement, um, which uh, begs us to, to, to think that majority of these uh, cardiac involvement are probably clinically silent. Imaging studies have found that asymptomatic cardiac involvement um, occur anywhere from 3.7 to about 54.9% of patients. Um, and the wide range of these prevalence data is likely related to a variety of factors, including you know, patient selection and the type of imaging technique that they use and the various protocols that they use. But one thing is for sure, uh, of, of all patients with cardiac sarcoidosis, those with cardiac involvement offer the worst prognosis. So we go on to um, a presentation. Uh, the presentation of these patients are very vague. Um, they can range anywhere from syncope, presyncope, um, palpitations or heart failure symptoms. And this is uh, typically a manifestations of the different complications of cardiac sarcoid as it affects the heart, which includes AV block, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias and heart failure. And we go to our first major question. Who should we screen for cardiac sarcoidosis? What are the reasons that we should think about cardiac sarcoidosis? And there's very, very few data out there that compare the sensitivity and the specificity of the various screening tests, but this is one such um, article, and, it, and I want you to focus on this one. Uh, this is a small study because it's a rare disease of 62 patients, and they found out that the presence of a positive screening variable in any of the following. If you have a positive uh, uh, history of cardiac symptoms and cardiac symptoms, I mean syncope, presyncope, palpitations or heart failure symptoms. If you have EKG abnormalities, which can range anywhere from AV block 
bundle branch block and atrial and ventricular arrhythmias, or if you have halter abnormalities that show the same abnormalities, or if you have an echo finding uh, showing LV dysfunction or RV dysfunction, or if you have wall motion abnormalities that are not um, in a coronary territory, or if you have aneurysms, focal or multifocal aneurysms. If you have a positive um, uh, on any of these clinical assessment tools that we use on a day-to-day -day basis, then the sensitivity, the sensitivity for the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid is about 100%. Now, granted, this is just 62 patients, but that's pretty much what we get for a rare disease such as sarcoidosis. So much so that in this expert consensus document that was published in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine uh, in 2017. This was a consensus document that was published by the uh, Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging and also the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology. It tells us three clinical scenarios where you should think about cardiac sarcoidosis. And the first clinical scenario talks about what we just talked about in that in any patient with a biopsy proven extra cardiac sarcoidosis, if they have any abnormalities in any of the following, if they have abnormal uh, 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 echocardiographic findings, EKG findings, Holter findings, or if they're symptomatic, they present with syncope, presyncope, palpitations, or heart failure symptoms, then you should think about cardiac sarcoidosis. In addition, even if you have no extra cardiac sarcoidosis that's biopsy proven, if you have a young patient, a young patient with significant AV block that you cannot explain. Now this patient did not have a tick bite, this patient's not on any medications that can cause AV block, then you should think about cardiac sarcoid. And the last clinical scenario, is if when you have a young patient, age 25 to 60 years old, with idiopathic sustained ventricular tachycardia, and you do not think that it's your typical outflow track, obstruct, uh, outflow track ventricular tachycardia or fascicular VT, then you should think about cardiac sarcoidosis. So these are the three clinical scenarios where you should think about cardiac sarcoidosis. This is the proposed criteria for the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid. This was published in, uh, uh, by the Heart Rhythm Society in 2014. And the only absolute test for cardiac sarcoidosis is a histologic exam of a tissue sample showing the hallmark of sarcoid, which is non-caseating, non-necrotizing granulomas. But you also have a clinical diagnosis because biopsy, endomyocardial biopsy only has a yield of about 20 to 25%. So you have a clinical diagnosis uh, which involves a biopsy proven extra cardiac sarcoid with one or more of the following. So if you have a steroid responsive cardiomyopathy or heart block, if you have unexplained LV dysfunction, if you have unexplained VT, if you have unexplained high degree AV block, or if you have a positive test on the multimodality imaging that we're gonna be talking about later, either on a cardiac PET or a cardiac MR, then you have a clinical diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid. Just for completion, I've put here the uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, Ministry of Health and Welfare criteria. They were the first to propose a diagnostic criteria for cardiac sarcoid, and it's pretty much similar. The only difference is they actually have placed weight on the uh, clinical uh, criteria that we just mentioned, and they divided this into a major and a minor criteria, with a major criteria being any advanced AV block, 
or a basal thinning in the in interventricular septum on echo. So this was in 2006. We still don't have the multimodality imaging techniques that we have right now, or if you have a depressed LV ejection fraction. And the minor criteria is the rest. So what about echo? Echo, unfortunately, um, although it's extremely useful in assessing the severity of you know, LV dysfunction or RV dysfunction, it's more limited in determining the cause of the cardiomyopathy because you can have cardiac sarcoid and have a normal echocardiogram, but the typical findings you see on echo are these focal aneurysms, these thinning, in a non-coronary distribution. And when the cardiac sarcoid progresses to form extensive scarring of the LV, you form uh, these dilated LVs and uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. So let's talk about multimodality imaging. We'll start with the MRI. It's good because it tells us scar and it also tells us structure and function of the heart. And that's very important because it's able to rule out the mimickers of cardiac sarcoid, particularly hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, ARVC. And so what we do is that we fast these patients for about 12 to 18 hours. And I was told here at Emory, we even fast them for a longer period of time for one to two days with a high fat diet. And this is to promote fatty acid metabolism in the heart and suppress background glucose utilization in the myocardium. So when you do your FDG PET, only areas of active inflammation will take up the FDG. Unfortunately, um, we're still early uh, in, in, in this uh, diagnostic modality. There's still no approved standardized quantitation of uptake of FDG uh, to make the diagnosis as well as the follow-up. And it's very, very important, and the ASNEC guidelines recommend it, that you should include, when you order a PET, you should include a rest perfusion imaging, and you can either do it with rubidium PET or ammonium PET uh, or SPECT. Uh, so what we do at Emory Midtown is a rubidium PET, and what we do at the VA is a LexiScan SPECT. Um, so what are the findings that you can expect to see in, uh, uh, for PET in patients with cardiac sarcoid? Uh, and uh, this was uh, beautifully uh, uh, explained in a study by uh, Dr. Blankstein and his team. Uh, and this is a study of 118 patients with no coronary artery disease and referred for a, a PET for uh, ruling out cardiac sarcoid. And what they used was a uh, rubidium PET. And they divided these patients into three categories. And the first category are those patients with an, uh, a normal perfusion with no FDG uptake. So if you have a normal perfusion with no FDG uptake, that's a normal study. Or if you have a normal perfusion with a diffuse uptake, so the uptake is all throughout your myocardium, then it's most likely because these patients probably did not fast as you explained, and you were not able to background suppress glucose utilization, and either you call it a normal variant, or if your clinical suspicion is high, you should repeat the test. The second, are, uh, the second group uh, are those with either a, uh, an abnormal perfusion defect or an abnormal FDG uptake. So the first group is if you have a normal perfusion with only a focal uptake. This is fairly nonspecific, but it could be, it could represent early disease with only a focal area of inflammation. And also if you have a rest perfusion defect 
but no FDG uptake, then these could represent scar. And as we know, scar is not only limited to cardiac sarcoid, but also with other etiologies. So you're not sure. So if you have a focal inflammation or a focal scar, you're still not sure. However, if you, if you belong to this group, it's highly likely that you have cardiac sarcoid in that if you have both an abnormal perfusion defect and abnormal FDG uptake, you likely have cardiac sarcoid. And the first group tells us if is, is that if you have an, an abnormal perfusion defect with a focal uptake in the same area, it usually tells us of active inflammation in the same location. And the, the same scenario, if you have a, an abnormal perfusion defect with a focal on diffuse uptake, these patients are likely the same as patient number one, but you just did not uh, suppress background glucose utilization as much. And the third scenario is if you have an abnormal perfusion defect with a focal or multifocal uptake in a different area. This usually tells us that there's both scar and inflammation in the heart, and that increases your likelihood that this is cardiac sarcoid. So to summarize, these are the findings that you can see on cardiac PET in these patients. You can have a normal PET with normal perfusion with no uptake, or you can have a normal perfusion with diffuse uptake throughout the myocardium, and these are the patients who probably did not fast very well. Or you can have a normal perfusion with a focal uptake, which is fairly nonspecific, but could probably tell you it's early in the disease. Or if you have an abnormal perfusion defect and a per focal uh, uptake of FDG in the same area, or an abnormal perfusion defect and a focal or a multifocal uh, FDG uptake in a different area, that's usually indicative of cardiac sarcoid. And if you have, or if you're very late in your disease and you have abnormal perfusion defect and no FDG uptake, this is usually indicative of a scar. So the same consensus statement uh, divide, uh, divided the, uh, uh, the FDG findings or the PET findings in accordance to the likelihood of cardiac sarcoid and that you probably have no cardiac sarcoid if you have a normal study. It's a possible cardiac sarcoid. Again, this is 10 to 50%. If you have either an abnormal perfusion defect um, with no focal uptake, indicative of a scar, or an ab or or normal perfusion defect with an abnormal FDG uptake, which could indicate an early uh, onset of disease, you will have. If you have multifocal FDG uptake with a normal perfusion defect either in the same area or a different area, then it's probably, probably cardiac sarcoid. Uh, so if it's focal, it's probably sarcoid. If it's multifocal in different areas, then it's highly probable that it is cardiac sarcoidosis. I told you that uh, uh, earlier that, that, that cardiac PET is helpful because it tells us about prognosis as well. And this was published on Dr. Blankstein's paper. And it says that if you have an abnormal perfusion defect and an F abnormal FDG uptake on top of that, you likely have, uh, you have a, a threefold increase in adverse events. And by adverse events, I mean death and appropriate ICD therapy. Incidentally, the same study found that the presence of an abnormal FDG uptake on the RV also confers a worse prognosis. So abnormal FDG uptake in the RV is bad. And that's important when we talk about the last uh, uh, part of our talk, which is risk stratification of patients with cardiac sarcoid. Now, what about response to therapy? 
Like I said earlier, there's no standardized value for the decrease in count as a cutoff for appropriate response to therapy that's still being developed. But usually we go by the SUV max or the standardized uptake value max. Um, and there's very small studies that show that a decrease in SUV max uh, confers a good response to therapy. But again, there's no quantitation for that. Um, and so this is just a study that uh, uh, we found um, and it shows that this patient initially had a heterogeneous FDG uptake and six months after immunotherapy, uh, if you, immunosuppression, there's uh, no FDG uptake. So this would be a good response therapy. Now we talk about the last part of our talk, which is management. And we are going to talk about management as it pertains to conduction abnormalities, atrial and ventricular tachyrhythmias, and heart failure. And finally, restratify these patients for sudden cardiac death. So for the conduction abnormalities, there's very few data, again, that talk specifically about cardiac sarcoid. So the uh, 2000, 2012 HRS device guidelines on high degree AV block also applies uh, to these patients. And, and, and we're just going to review on the class one um, uh, indications in that permanent pacemaker implantation is indicated if you have a high degree AV block with bradycardia and you're symptomatic. If you have a high degree AV block and ventricular arrhythmias, if you have high degree AV block and you need the drug therapy like beta blockers, uh, you know, for example, in guideline directed medical therapy in patients with heart failure, or if you have a high degree AV block and an asystole period greater than three seconds, if you have an escape rhythm of less than 40 beats per minute, or if, if you have an escape rhythm that's wide QRS and you know it's probably below the AV node, if you have a history of AFib and you have a five second pause, a pacemaker is indicated. If you have AV block after a catheter ablation, if you have an AV block after any kind of procedure in the setting of neuromuscular disease, if you have symptomatic bradycardia, regardless of the site of the block, again, if you have an escape rhythm that's 40 beats per minute, or if you have the presence of LV dysfunction or AV block during exercise, these are all class one indications for permanent pacemaker placement. In addition, there are three cardiac sarcoid specific recommendations from the HRS consensus statement. And the first is, and the first is, is that you can implant a pacemaker on a cardiac sarcoid with high degree AV block, even if their AV block reverses transiently with immunosuppression. And I will talk later about why. The second is that this is probably the only uh, uh, AV block where immunosuppression can be helpful. Um, so you can use that. And finally, and finally, if you have an indication for pacemaker placement in a cardiac sarcoid patient, it can be useful to just upgrade that to an ICD. So if you have any of the class one indications for pacemaker, you can upgrade it to an ICD. And this is uh, uh, the reason for the, 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 the cardiac specific recommendation from the HRS, this is a pooled uh, case series studies of patients with high degree AV block and cardiac sarcoid. And as you can see here of the 57 patients, of the 57 patients with high degree AV block and was given steroids, only 27 or about 47% of them had AV nodal recovery. So only about half of these patients will have AV nodal recovery and so if you're, you're, you're not sure, and these patients have all of the class one or, 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 or any of the class one indications, then you can put in a pacemaker placement. 
In contrast, of the 16 patients, of the 16 patients who had high degree AV block and did not receive immunosuppression, none of them, none of them had AV nodal recovery. So let's talk about the next one, which is atrial tachyarrhythmia. The true prevalence is low. It's about, uh, is, is unknown, but you know, small studies have shown that it can be up to 32% of, of patients with cardiac sarcoid. The most common is usually atrial fibrillation. And uh, most of the arrhythmias are secondary to the scar formation. Uh, and these are based off of electroanatomic mapping studies. And the HRS recommendations are as follows. You, if they have atrial fibrillation, you can anticoagulate them based off of your CHADS2 VAS score. This is not to be confused by hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with AFib in that in those patients, you anticoagulate them directly. Um, if these patients have very uh, uh, refractory um, atrial tachyarrhythmia, you can consider an EP study. And remember, these are scar-based tachyarrhythmias in that if you remember from Dr. Merchant's talk a few days ago, you should avoid class one agents because of the CAS trial. So your agents of choice are your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, dofetilide, sotalol, and amiodarone. There's very few data on the role of immunosuppression. There's really no HRS formal recommendation just because of the lack of data. How about ventricular arrhythmias? The mechanism is usually macro reentry around the scar, and the strategy usually involves uh, twofold. And the first one is immunosuppression with antiarrhythmic, and your catheter based ablation should be reserved only in, uh, uh, in, set, in, in patients with VT who are not responsive to medications. And I'll talk about later why. And immunosuppression have, you know, it, it's, it, these are very small studies and they have contrasting data, but the consensus, state, the, the consensus statement advocate for steroid therapy, especially early in the disease, when you still have a preserved LV function, meaning you still, you know, you, you don't have an extensive scar yet, these patients may respond to immunosuppression. And for the antiarrhythmic, uh, you can use, you know, the most widely used is amiodarone and sotalol. And how about catheter ablation? I want to uh, highlight just two case series studies. And the first study is by Jeffick. Um, um, it's an ablation study of about nine patients who uh, had a VT ablation after they failed medical therapy. These patients had a 44% recurrence. Um, uh, four out of nine patients had recurrence of VT after VT ablation. Unfortunately, in this study by Copeland, they have a 75% recurrence, or about six out of eight patients had recurrence of VT after ablation. And the primary, uh, the, the primary difference is because the Copeland study were sicker. They had a lower ejection fraction of about 30%. So naturally, they're more worse substrate. They have more extensive scar. That's probably why they had a higher recurrence rate. So ablation is probably reserved only in refractory cases. And there's a certain type of patient where you should probably not do it if their EF is very, very low and they have extensive scarring. Now on to the last one. I still have uh, five minutes. There's very few data on risk stratification. So the data from the primary and secondary uh, ICD prevention ICD trials apply. And I wanna highlight um, um, these studies because these studies uh, tell us that patients with cardiac sarcoid seem to be at risk of ICD, uh, of, of appropriate ICD therapy more than um, the other patients. And the first study is this one by Crohn. It's a, a 
uh, a study of 235 patients across 13 institutions. They followed these patients up for four, and, uh, four years. And of the 235, 84 had at least one appropriate ICD therapy. And they found that these patients usually are male. They have a history of syncope and they have lower ejection fraction. And as you can see here, of the 84 patients, more than 10 had at, uh, more than, uh, at least 30 patients had more than 10 appropriate ICD therapy. And what this study also tells us is that patients that have a mildly impaired LV ejection fraction were also at substantial risk for, ICE or for appropriate ICD therapy, so much so that majority of these 84 patients actually had an LV ejection fraction of more than 35%. The mean ejection fraction of the patients in the appropriate ICD arm is 38%. Uh, uh, indicating that patients with an ejection fraction that's more than 35 may still be at risk. And the second study is this study by Schuler. It's 112 patients. 36 patients or 32% had appropriate ICD therapy. And what's important in this study is that they found that in those with a normal EF and a normal RV ejection fraction had no, uh, uh, none of these patients had appropriate ICD therapy. So if you have a normal RV ejection fraction, and like we said earlier, if you have no, uh, uh, FDG uptake in your RV, that's usually a good prognostic sign. So what are the class one recommendations? These are from the primary and secondary uh, ICD uh, trials in that if you have an aborted cardiac arrest or a spontaneous VT, uh, it's a class one indication to put in an ICD. If you have an EF less than 35 despite medical therapy and immunosuppression, it's a class one indication to put in an ICD. And if, again, if you have an indication for permanent pacemaker placement, you can put in an ICD, it can be useful. And if you have a syncope that you think is arrhythmogenic in character, you can put in an ICD. And if you have, if you send these patients to the EP lab and you have clinically significant sustained VT, ICD can be useful. Because of those two studies I just mentioned, it's a class 2B recommendation that if they have a, mo if, if a uh, moderate to uh, mild to moderately reduced ejection fraction of a 36 to 49%, or if they have an RV ejection fraction less than 40%, you may consider putting in an ICD. So that's a whole lot. Um, I can recap in five minutes so that we can uh, nail this. And, and uh, the first thing is, you should screen patients. You should think about ICD uh, of, of uh, uh, cardiac sarcoidosis in patients with biopsy proven extra cardiac uh, sarcoid if they have symptoms, EKG abnormalities, and echo abnormalities, or if they're a young patient, 25 to 60 years old, and unexplained AV block or if they have unexplained VT and you don't think it's fascicular or outflow tract VT, you should screen them for cardiac sarcoid and we should start with the cardiac MR. And with the cardiac MR, we should estimate the likelihood of cardiac sarcoid based off our WASL criteria. And we are looking for late catalinium enhancement. And these, uh, the, the classic pattern is multifocal mid myocardial to sub epicardial. We're gonna look for the specific signs such as the triangle sign where it hooks or it inserts into the RV insertion point or the hook sign. And if uh, those uh, uh, findings are negative, but your, light, your, your clinical suspicion is still high, you should go for an FDG PET. Remember to include a rest perfusion scan, and we're looking about uh, we're looking for both an abnormal perfusion defect and a focal or multifocal patchy diffuse uptake. And if that's positive, then you should start these patients on immunosuppression. If they have uh, arrhythmias, uh, uh, atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, you should start them on an antiarrhythmic. 
If they're heart failure, you should start them on guidance directed medical therapy, and you should look for class one indications to put in a pacemaker placement. You should risk stratify these patients uh, uh, on who needs an ICD, and that if they have sustained VT on or, or an aborted cardiac arrest, um, you should uh, ICD is a class one indication. If they have an LV ejection fraction of less than 35%, you should put in an ICD. If they have an indication for pacemaker, they have a syncope you think is arrhythmogenic in character, or if they have inducible VT on an EP study, it's a two-way recommendation to put in an ICD. Or if they have an LV ejection fraction of 36 to 49%, or an RV ejection fraction of less than 40% despite medical therapy, it's a class 2B recommendation to put in an ICD. Finally, if all that's negative and you're still very concerned, you can uh, order cardiac MR. And remember about the uh, systematic uh, review that we talked about earlier, and that the absence of late gadolinium enhancement, none of those patients had ventricular arrhythmias. So if you don't see late gadolinium enhancement, you should not put in an ICD. But if they have late gadolinium enhancement, you should send them to, you should consider sending them to the EP lab. And they have, if they have clinic, clinically significant VT, ICD can be useful. If not, you should not consider an ICD. And with that, I end. Thank you very much for. For, for listening. Ha, I have two minutes. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, it was very good. And sorry uh, to those of you out there for some technical uh, Zoom issues during the talk. Thank you for, uh, for sticking it out. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, it was a very good review, Marvin. Any, um, anyone wanna chime in with a question here in the last two minutes? Um, yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, so Marvin, say you, you were talking about screening and the prognostic implications of, um, LGE. So let's say that you, you screen a patient and it's, I don't know, 55 year old African-American woman. She has a right bundle branch block, mm -hmm. um, echo finding suggestive of, um, sarcoid and you do a cardiac MR she has hook sign triangle sign, you know, obviously RV involvement, et cetera. So that suggesting, you know, from your presentation that it's a poor, um, sort of portends a, a poor, uh, or has poor prognostic implications. Would you look for extra cardiac sarcoid or would you just say, hey, I think this is what it is. We know LG is a, has a poor prognostic implication. I'm gonna put a device in her. What would you do? Um, so in, in those patients, um, if they have uh, a no, and, and you can, you, you can you tell me what you think, uh, but in those patients with no biopsy proven extra cardiac sarcoid, uh, because you have those specific signs and, and you know, these, it, there's not a whole lot of disease out there that can have these specific findings on late gadolinium enhancement, I would... Um, probably uh, put in an ICD uh, uh, already. Um, and um, uh, on top of that, also try to look for extra cardiac sarcoid. But what do you think, Marcelo? Um, I, I wouldn't because I, I think for practical reasons, I don't know that insurance would pay for it without histology. Like, I don't know how you get, get it paid. Um, and also, I think you need, you need to try steroids for a bit. Like, I think you... I think you would need to try to give this patient some, you know, prednisone and try to calm down the sort of inflammation, which is sort of the substrate for um, macro reentry and subsequent VT. Um, and I don't know, I, I think these patients, I know that biopsies, you know, endomyocardial biopsy is, has low yield, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but you can still make the clinical diagnosis with like having extra cardiac histology. Yeah. And I think these patients deserve a shot. Like, like you should try to, in my mind, I think that you, you should probably try to look for other sites of involvement, see if you can get tissue, um, which you would need anyway for, for the clinical diagnosis. Maybe try some steroids and see if that, see if you can get that calmed down. But I, I don't know if that's the right answer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I uh, like I said earlier, uh, uh, the the diagnosis of cardiac sarcoid is still not definite. Uh, I get what you yeah. say, uh, 
Um, but, uh, uh, you know, if, if anybody else has something in mind, I think this is a great discussion. Um, you know, I, I think it can both ways, uh, it can go both ways. I think we should include the patient in our clinical decision making. We should try to tell them that, hey, this is the, these are uh, what the studies found. You're at risk, but we're not sure. Um, so, you know. Yeah. 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 And then for, uh, just, I just had one question about pet FTG. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think for FTG uptake, the other differentials obviously include, you know, inflammation, aside from inflammation, infection and ischemia. Yeah. So how, how would you approach a situation where you, you know, you have a patient with CAD, uh -huh. um, but you're uncertain because you, you're uncertain if the FTG uptake is from, let's say, ischemic memory or, or whatever uh -huh. versus true active, you know, macrophage uptake, secondary to active inflammation. How, how would you contextualize, like, what would you do to sort of contextualize that, those findings in someone that there, yeah, has it, yeah, That's a great question. Uh, and and uh, uh, there's no 100% certainty, but, but the first thing you can try to look for um, is, is if it follows a coronary distribution. Um, and, and if it's, uh, you know, if it's right, if the FDG up, if the F, so the FDG uptake denotes active inflammation. Um, yeah. So if that's in the area where you have the ischemic territory, then potentially, uh, uh, you know, it could be ischemia. Uh, and and that, that's when we uh, dive into the complementary effects of, of uh, PET and MR. So I think in those questionable cases, uh, because uh, 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 it will adversely affect our management, we should think about doing a cardiac MR and, and look for the, the pattern um, that's consistent, the, the LGE pattern uh, that's consistent with cardiac sarcoid, you know, the mid myocardial, the sub epicardial, as yeah. opposed to the sub endocardial with ischemia. Yeah. I think the, the other thing to keep in mind is that. If we do a PET, you have CT attenuation correction. So you can always look at the CT and see if there's, um, you know, involvement or, or whatever coronary you think is involved. Yeah. The yeah. other thing too, you, you can always do a, I mean, in patients that, you know, have underlying CAD, et cetera, you can also do a rest stress, right, to rule out that particular, you know, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean involvement. Those yeah, yeah th those all patients with the cardiac pet uh, like like uh, I mentioned earlier all these patients who you should talk you, you you're ordering an FDG pet all of them uh, as per the as no what I'm saying like a perfusion rush I think you should you could probably in these patients order rest stress perfusion um, to see if, if there is um, versus like a rest versus, versus a rest FDG where I you're not what you you're mean. Not yeah, yeah. inducing so, ischemia yeah, yeah. Yeah. So these patients should probably get an ischemic workup. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, 100% sure. Yeah. So that's all I have. Agreed. To and, and no, I mean, that's a good point. You look for coronary calcium and then obviously take the risk. I mean, if it's a 22 year old with no other risk factors, you know, you can, you know, you can argue right. over the utility of, a, of an ischemic workup in that patient. Right. All right. Well, very good talk. Uh, and thank you, Marcelo, for the questions. Um, uh, I get Dr. Sherman had a real quick one uh, that I'm not sure there's an answer to, but he said for a patient with aneurysms, let's say a patient with normal EF, no VT, but has aneurysms, um, any special consideration for ICD in that, in the patient like that? Um, so again, so I, so if these aneurysms are, are in your FDG, uh, you know, are these aneurysms on the echo findings? Or? Yeah. Yes, let's say they're on echo. So if it's if it's on the echo findings, then you should uh, 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 do a, a cardiac MR one uh, to confirm your diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis, and you try to look for those bad prognostic signs: the presence of late gadolinium enhancement, if their ejection fraction is low, if there if the the late gadolinium enhancement in is in the basal anterior septum, um, uh, and you have significant AV block, you have an indication for pacemaker placement. 
the, all these things uh, uh, should play a role in your decision to risk stratify these patients for an ICD. So I guess the short answer is um, uh, an aneurysm is not enough for you to put in an ICD. You should uh, uh, put together your clinical assessment uh, as well as the multimodality imaging uh, that we just talked about. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.